In the United States, we treat the Constitution, a representation of universal and ever-evolving ideas, as a collection of immutable, rigid laws. But in a 1,600-square-foot mural in the plenary hall of the Legislative Palace of Ecuador, I see an alternative. Hanging above the nation's equivalent of the U.S. Senate or House chamber, a massive 23-panel installation by one of, if not the most cherished and celebrated Ecuadorian artists, is Imagen de la Patria by Oswaldo Guayasanin, an image which I will argue not only, albeit inadvertently, fulfills the role of a constitution, but does so more effectively than the common modern written constitution, particularly in the context of a nation like Ecuador on the path to recovery from colonization. However, before we jump into an exploration of Guayasanin's mural, let's talk about constitutions. On the screen, you will see a compilation of several dictionary definitions of constitution. While they all vary slightly, the salient commonalities are a mention of an institution's principles and some system of governance. So, let us examine Imagen de la Patria's strengths and weaknesses as a foundational document, so to speak, for post-colonial Ecuador through these two lenses, beginning with how it reflects the nation's principles, laying out a newly shaped national identity, putting forth philosophical guides, and defining the responsibilities of the government and citizens to each other. The historical forces that abused and took advantage of Ecuador and its people were crucial to Guayasamin's understanding of the nation's history, and thus his notion of the best path forward. Although most of the mural is vivid and colorful, five black panels represent the primary antagonists in the recent history of Ecuador. The first, el caudillismo. The second, la oligarquía y la burguesía. The third, el populismo, and the fourth, militarismo, represent the authoritarian, corrupt, and violent leaders who had taken control of the nation in the preceding centuries. While those villains of Ecuador's story have become somewhat widely accepted by the time this mural was commissioned, the two remaining dark tiles sparked a little bit more controversy. One black square features a grimacing skeleton wearing a Nazi helmet, which reads CIA. Given the very recent history of American interference in Latin America, which was the source of so much of the grief that Guayasanin captured through his career, this spotlight on American hypocrisy, especially throughout the Cold War, is anything but surprising. And the final dark panel is only partially in the shadows. It is a portrait of a priest who represents the Catholic Church. While the dimmer portion of the panel is consistent with Guayasanin's ardent advocacy for secularism and criticism in the church's role as an accomplice in exploitation and torture, the lighter side acknowledges that the church had also been a force for good when it led the denunciation of atrocities against indigenous populations. The theme of duality, recognizing both mistakes in the past and the potential to do good in the future, both suppression and resistance, both strength and weakness, is a common thread throughout the mural and shows the tenuous state of Ecuador at the time. Throughout the mural, Guayasamin also does not shy away from placing the desolate and bleak state of the nation as it continues to recover from the demons of its past. El drama de la pobreza, or the drama of poverty, depicts a mother and her child starving, speaking to the physical sustenance that has been stripped from the region by colonialism and the subsequent power grabs. Similarly, La Niña Se Abandonado, or The Abandoned Childhood, depicts two children who have been abandoned by their parents and represent the youth who had been left without food, healthcare, education, or families due to the poverty and violence of the preceding decades. The man in the next panel, La Patria Maniatada, or Bound Homeland, is on his knees with his hands tied behind his back and wild eyes bulging out of his skull. He serves as a reminder that although the people of Ecuador and its neighboring countries gained freedom from the official bondage by European colonizers, the oppression of Western hegemony is still a forceful presence. In a similar vein, a small panel in the upper left corner of the mural depicts the head of Rosa Zarate, a feminist and emblem of the Ecuadorian independence movement in the early 19th century, hanging from a pike in Plaza de Santo Domingo in Quito after she and her husband, Nicolás de la Peña, another revolutionary were captured. Similarly, the tall yellow panel on the far right of the mural, known as La Tortura es Maldita, or The Torture is Damned, depicts a man positioned as if he was being hung, an all too common practice for dealing with political dissidents at the time. These two panels highlight a very personal issue for Guayasamin, who lost many friends and mentors to political persecution, and brings attention to the censorship of intellectual exploration, which was so prevalent during the Cold War, and ultimately stifled the rejuvenation of national identity, as well as political and economic systems throughout the continent. While most capital buildings feature artwork that is flattering to the relevant nation, Guayasamin's mural makes it impossible for legislators to ignore the true extent and depth of the problems facing their constituents while formulating policy. 
Pues I mean centers, both physically and in the mind of the observer, the rich indigenous culture of Ecuador to counteract its historical erasure and subsequent abuse. At the center of the mural is a black circle, which represents the cosmos in the Awa, an extinct indigenous group's tradition. The color black symbolizes el todo y el nada, everything and nothing, from which the sun, depicted as the red square and representing man, and the moon, depicted as the red circle and representing woman, are born. Having spent his career capturing and protesting against the oppression of indigenous peoples throughout Latin America, Baguayasa means to honor the customs and faith of one of those peoples so prominently in the Capitol building, marks a major step forward for the nation's social attitudes and cultural decolonization. Moreover, the yellow hands at the center of the mural are stretched toward the sky, representing the people of Ecuador giving thanks to the sun, nature, and their ancestors, and receiving their gifts back. The hands are particularly significant because of their contrast to the rest of Guayasamin's work, which is known for his chilling, skeleton-like depictions of hands. His typical work uses hands to show the pain and desperation of his subjects. So a piece that shows the joy of the nation's culture is a significant and noteworthy departure. The final major component of Guayasamin's homage to Ecuador's pre-Columbian traditions is the condor, with its wings outstretched above the rest of the piece. Not only are condors the most sacred bird in the Incan tradition, but it is also a reference to Guayasamin's 1957 mural, El Toro y el Condor, The Bull and the Condor, a massive installation at La Capilla de Hombre, Guayasamin Museum in his hometown of Quito, that features a condor fighting back against a bull, both a reference to Andean mythology and symbolic of Ecuador fighting back against the Spanish. In addition to the illusions made with the condor, its colors warrant further examination. The bird is primarily red, which reminds the viewers how close the species is to extinction. But the shadow cast by its wings is blue, the color of life, symbolizing that the condor yearns to be reborn. In this way, the condor is synonymous with the cultural preservation and economic future of Latin America, perched on the edge of a cliff with the potential to fly, fall, or idle with each gust of wind. Where Samin continues to dive into the region's rich and often ignored history of revolutionaries and leaders, uplifting prominent thinkers and politicians who fought to free and uplift the people of Ecuador as inspiration for those of the future. In the upper left of the mural, Guayasamin includes a panel entitled Las Mujeres, or the Women, which features Dolores Cacungo, a native politician, farmer, and defender of human rights, Manuela Sáenz, known as La Libertadora del Libertador, or the Liberatress of the Liberator, for her work with Simón Bolívar to free modern-day Venezuela, Bolivia, Colombia, Ecuador, Peru, and Panama from Spanish Empire, and Manuela Canizares, who hosted and participated in the meeting between Ecuadorian rebels in 1809 that ultimately resulted in the formation of the first rebel government, Junta Autónoma de Quito, and their Declaration of Independence. In addition to these prominent activists, Guayasamin features his own intellectual influences in the panels, Los Pensadores, or the Thinkers, and El Combatiente Intelectual, or the Intellectual Combatant. These scholars include Juan Montalvo, known for his anti-clericalism and anti-cadillo stances, Eugenio Espejo, also known as Luis Jussi, the first indigenous doctor who both conducted research on the health impacts of hygiene and challenged the laws that discriminated against him due to his race, Vicente Rocofuerte, the leader of a series of revolts against Spain, Gran Colombia, and the oppressive politicians before becoming president himself, and Jose Peralta, the minister of education under Eloy Alfaro, who advocated secular education and negotiated an agreement with the Vatican. The presence of these individuals in Guayasamin's work in the legislative hall for the nation signifies both that the nation is taking back control over the narrative of its own history, thus reclaiming and reshaping its national identity to break free from the colonial mindset, and also proclaiming the nation's guiding values as liberty and fairness. This narrative is further solidified by the prominent and striking image of the former president Eloy El Faro emerging from fire. Prior to his time in office, El Faro spent nearly 30 years fighting conservatism, and earned the title of Viejo Luchador, or Old Warrior, for his role in the Liberal Revolution of 1895. And in office, Alfaro led the secularization and modernization of Ecuador. Although Alfaro's time in office was fragmented due to the political volatility of the time, and he was eventually assassinated, Guayasa means mural, and the government's allowance of the mural, implies a commitment to the resurgence of Alfaro's radical liberal party's ideals. 
In addition to recognizing these features, YSNN uses this mural to remind citizens and legislators alike of their responsibilities to their shared nation. The largest and most central of these panels is La Tierra, or the Earth, in which a stooped peasant representing Pachama, the goddess of earth, time, fertility, planting, harvesting, mountains, and earthquakes for the indigenous tribes of the Andes, tending to a plant. This imagery highlights the relationship of the indigenous peoples of Ecuador to the land for both their economic and cultural survival. In that vein, the top left panel, Los Indios, or the Indians, represents the indigenous people of Ecuador. The painting shows the profiles of two indigenous people, which also combine to make one face. This symbolizes the importance of the indigenous peoples of Ecuador coming together and using their voices to push for the undoing of their erasure and oppression by colonial forces of the past and their own society in the present. Just like the conjure imagery at the center of the mural, this is an example of Guayasamin recentering the indigenous people of Ecuador, both in the narrative of the nation and in the minds of the legislators. He then expands that image in El Puño de la Lusa, or the fist of the fight, which features a partially formed fist representing the material social power of workers and the indigenous in Ecuador, and El Proletariado, or the proletariat, which depicts the current status of workers, on their knees, full of doubt, fear, and frustration, and abused for centuries for political power, to further push the narrative of the government's responsibilities to those who have been oppressed throughout the country's recent history. Lastly, El Pueblo Profundo, or the Profound Citizenry, depicts the public watching over the government to hold them accountable, while El Futuro, or the Future, depicts a group of children observing the legislators to learn how their futures will be impacted by the government's actions. These two images further highlight the responsibilities of both the people and the government to the nation, reminding the legislators of who they are there to serve and who ultimately holds the power in a democratic nation. Now that we've established that the mural more than satisfactorily outlines Guayasamin's notion of the aspirational principles for Ecuador and its governance, let's consider why this may be a superior method to the currently standard written constitution. First of all, Guayasamin's background in and of itself may make him more qualified to express the will of the people than, say, the American founding fathers. Born on July 6, 1919, to a Quechua father and a Mestiza mother in Quito, Ecuador, with a lack of talent for academics and a natural affinity for the visual arts, Oswaldo Guayasamin was primed to become an influential voice in a Latin America that was reckoning with the remnants of colonialism. However, his path of rebellion through art was carved in stone when his best friend was shot and killed during a coup d'etat in 1932. During his career, Guayasamin also had the opportunity to travel through indigenous communities of Latin America and around the world. Thus, Guayasamin was intimately familiar with the detrimental impacts of colonial oppression and its remnants, as well as with the impacts of soft colonialism of the Cold War for everyday citizens of Ecuador. Moreover, he was no stranger to artistic rebellion and its consequences. His art regularly invoked outrage from some of the most notorious leaders and dictators of the Cold War era, and even Imagen de la Patria, with its depiction of the United States as comparable in its behavior towards Latin America to Nazi Germany, nearly prompted the United States to cancel millions of dollars in aid to Ecuador, demonstrating his unyielding conviction to speaking on behalf of those who have been held down for generations. By contrast, the authors of the United States Constitution were comprised entirely of rich boys, the exact class of people who were increasingly recognized as active instigators and perpetuators of oppression and inequality, an all too common set of traits in constitutional authors around the world. In addition to the artist's identity, the medium in and of itself also makes the mural more accessible for the nation's citizens and separates it from the language of their formal colonizers and oppressors by avoiding language altogether. On the former point, while only around 8% of Ecuador's overall population are illiterate, around 30% of its indigenous population is, meaning that for those who need protection from the constitution and government the most, a visual constitution is more accessible from a purely pragmatic point of view. On the latter point, I believe the following quotation from Jamaica Kincaid's A Small Point synthesizes what may be off-putting about a constitution written in Spanish. Or isn't it odd that the only language I have in which to speak of this crime is the language of the criminals who committed the crime? Just as Kincaid is conflicted about writing of the colonial impacts on her home island of Antigua, for a constitution representing Ecuador's desire to rediscover its own identity and freedom, to be expressed in a tongue which represents exactly what they are trying to escape, brings about an inherent dissonance. By contrast, although Guayasamin received some of his artistic education in the West, and his style shows some influence of European post-impressionism, his style is still unique and quite distinct, and its primary influences come from indigenous art, 
history, and his own witnessing of the suffering of his people. Thus, not only are the values expressed in his Imagen de la Patria, but the matter in which they are expressed make it more reflective of the desires of the people. Now that we've discussed how Guayasamin's piece more effectively encapsulates and communicates aspirational values for the redeveloping Ecuador, let's move on to the potentially more controversial component in defense of a work of art as a founding legal document for a nation. My response to this argument is both quite simple and a bit confounding. The painting does not provide the basis for a functional system of governance, and that is part of what makes it a good constitution and a particularly well-suited constitution for people on the mend from colonialism. Now, I know in the United States, we tend to be very proud of our federalist, bicameral, pseudo-democracy laid out in the Constitution. We'd love to brag about how we did it first and flaunt our status as the great experiment. However, this is a bit ironic when you consider our propensity for encouraging children by using the great myth of Thomas Edison's 1,000 failed attempts at the light bulb. The moral of which is, you may fail repeatedly, but you need to get back up and persevere in order to accomplish something remarkable. Or, if we recognize and teach our children that when doing something groundbreaking, you often don't get it right on the first try, why do we not consider that a group of people who grew up steeped in monarchies and aristocracies and had never witnessed anything close to a true democracy could concoct a comprehensive system to govern one? While amendments and evolving interpretations by the Supreme Court acknowledge and ameliorate this problem to some degree, it takes one glance at current systems of voter suppression and the suffocating degree of wealth disparity within the modern United States to see that those systems are not enough. While there is some argument for the stability that arguably accompanies a written constitutional document, it is not unheard of for a substantial and long-standing government to have an unwritten, or more accurately, uncodified constitution. For example, the United Kingdom notoriously does not have a constitution in the same sense that the United States does, and the University College London explains why. In other countries, many of whom have experienced revolution or regime change, it has been necessary to start from scratch or begin from first principles, constructing new state institutions and defining in detail their relations with each other and their citizens. By contrast, the British constitution has evolved over a long period of time, reflecting the relative stability of the British polity. It has never been thought necessary to consolidate the basic building blocks of this order in Britain. What Britain has instead is an accumulation of various statutes, conventions, judicial decisions, and treaties, which collectively can be referred to as the British Constitution. In other words, the slow development of Britain's government has made this collection of documents a more natural progression than the relatively radical implementation of an entirely new document like the Constitution of the United States. While Ecuador may seem more comparable to the US than the UK, because we in the US commonly think of this nation's history as beginning with the gaining of its independence from Spain and tend to associate Latin America with repeated coups and overall instability, when we consider Ecuador as a nation finding a way to reconcile its Spanish influences with its now largely erased legacy of its pre-Columbian history, it seems increasingly appropriate to apply the more British model to Ecuador. And this model becomes increasingly attractive when considering that a. Ecuador has had 20 different official constitutions since gaining its independence in 1830, so seeking an alternative form may be a worthwhile and beneficial endeavor. And b. No Latin American country or any country for that matter, has successfully detangled its colonial past and or found a promising path forward. So Ecuador does not have much to model its government after, and thus some flexibility could prove important. For this reason, placing an emphasis on a comprehensive set of values, and then experimenting with systems which support and further those values, as Oswaldo Guayasamin did in his mural Imagen de la Patria, may be a superior style of foundational document. And perhaps the most important advantage to expressing those values through visual art is that it requires thought to read. With the written word, it can be easy to fall into the trap of merely piecing together dictionary definitions without any nuance or consideration for context. Moreover, interpretations of nebulous words and phrases like liberty or pursuit of happiness or men can shift so significantly from person to person and time to time that they no longer mean anything at all. While art is similarly ambiguous and open to interpretation, we accept that trait in paintings in a way that we do not with prose. Thus, it is literally pragmatically impossible to forget that we must reframe our explanations of art based on the words, events, and conditions of the current moment, so that potent universal emotions and sensations evoked by a masterpiece 
with Imahen de la Patria maintain their integrity, remaining universal over time, because they remind us to keep thinking and reflecting.